Oops. There we go. Hey, how's it going? It is your muscle building coach, Lee Hayward. Just so getting my camera set up here. I, I nudged my setup that I have here. Okay, I think we're good. Welcome to the Total Fitness Bodybuilding video chat for Friday, February the 1st. And the way this video chat's going to work is I'm going to be hanging out here for the next hour, answering questions and basically discussing strategies to help you with your muscle building and fat loss goals. So if you have anything that you would like to discuss with regards to your workouts, uh, anything with regards to nutrition or supplementation, uh, maybe any specific challenges that you're dealing with, Feel free to post those questions, comments, and topics of discussion in our video chat window, and I'll do the best I can to help you out during our chat today. So I'm just going to get a few things organized on my end here. Uh, for those of you who are tuned in right now, if you can hear me, if you can see me, this is coming through loud and clear, please let me know in our video chat window, uh, just so I can make sure that I'm not talking to dead air here. I want to make sure that the audio is coming through loud and clear. All right, just give me a second now. I get a few things organized from my end here. Okay, loud and clear, loud and clear. Good stuff. Thank you. I do appreciate that. Now, before I got going today, I was actually just out for a walk for uh, my cardio took my dog out for a walk and it is freezing outside today it's not so much that it's so cold temperature wise but the wind chill makes it very cold so i uh, feel a bit i don't know if you can't see it or not now but i was really flushed in the face my face was blood red when i came in after my walk today because it was just so cold and windy but that's all part of it and toughens you up the cold does it definitely gets gets the air flowing the oxygen flowing and it toughens you up in the process all right Good stuff. All right. Now, one of the things that I want to discuss today uh, with regards to training and nutrition and all that is some specific challenges that I find that a lot of people deal with, especially as they get older. And this uh, just recently, this past week, I actually had a little minor setback with my own training. And it wasn't serious because I was aware of what was going on, but I find that when you get on a roll with your workouts and you start making progress and you're getting consistent, you're getting motivated and you're really, really determined to make some progress. And that's kind of the phase that I'm at now because I've, over the past year, I've really got my shit together, so to speak, as far as training consistently, cleaning up my diet and just getting the motivation and the desire to really get back in shape again. And I've been making some good progress. And I decided to try changing up my workout and, and doing some different exercises. And I was doing some uh, uh, more explosive style training with my workouts, just to work on not so much plyometric, but just doing some more explosive exercises. And sure enough, when I did, I felt uh, my chest, shoulder area twinge a little bit. Now, as soon as it happened, you know, I immediately stopped what I was doing and did some, you know, like just massage and things like that to kind of ease it up. And then since then, I've been doing some active recovery things. So it wasn't a major injury, but if I wasn't aware of what was going on and I pursued and pushed, tried to push through the pain, it could have easily turned into a major injury. So it's, it's one of those things I find that the older I get with my training, the more I have to keep reminding myself to respect my limitations and respect my body. It's like the mind is willing, but the flesh is weak. You know, you've heard that old saying before, right? The mind is willing, but the flesh is weak. And I find that that applies so much more for guys who are 40s, 50s, 60s, and beyond. You may be willing and, and have the desire to train, but you have to be more respectful of your body. And, and some of the things that I really encourage you to do when it comes to respecting your body, one, take extra time to warm up. This is, is something that everybody needs to do, regardless if you're young or old, but more so when you get older, because your joints, tendons, and ligaments are not as forgiving as they once were. It usually takes longer to get that blood flow and that circulation and kind of get the kinks and the cracks out of the joints and all that. So pay extra attention to your warm-up. Now, for myself, I usually start off with about 10 minutes of cardio to get a general you know, just elevate my core temperature and kind of get a sweat going before I even start my workout. So that's my 
my pre-workout warm-up right there is just 10 minutes of cardio. I usually like to do like the rowing machine or maybe the elliptical with the moving handle, something that's going to get the upper and lower body engaged. So I do that first, get a sweat going, and then I'm going to do some specific mobility exercises, usually mobility exercises for the neck, for the shoulders, for the elbows, uh, for, for the chest and back, like arm circles and different types of movements, uh, trunk rotations, deep knee bends, and whatever exercises I'm going to be doing that day. I'll also do several progressively uh, heavier warm-up sets for those specific exercises. Uh, a lot of times, even just going through the motions with the empty barbell or, or whatever for those specific moves to really help to focus on the particular areas that I'm going to train. So, for example, in, in yesterday's workout, I did some uh, box squats. That was my main exercise. And before I did that, I just started off with deep knee bends with body weight, did some squats with just the empty barbell, and then just gradually did progressively heavier warm-up set after warm-up set. From there, working my way up to my top weight working sets for the exercise. And I find taking time to do this, it's it, it does add time to your workouts. Absolutely. I mean, it, it, this is easily can add 20 minutes to a workout routine. But it is time well spent. Because if you don't do this and you end up getting injured, then that's going to set you back so much further with your training. So the, it's, it's such an important part and something that I can't emphasize enough. And I, I've even this past week now, I've twinged my own shoulder, chest area. And part of it was that I wasn't doing a proper or, or thorough enough warm up beforehand. So again, I, I really want to emphasize this. And I find that it's uh, definitely something that I want to encourage you to pay extra attention to. And if you do find that something doesn't feel right with your workouts, even if it's a routine that you've normally done or a workout that you've normally done, some days you may feel a bit off. Like for whatever reason, it's just not your day. If you feel that something doesn't feel right, don't hesitate to stop that exercise and either do something totally else, something totally different or just scrap the workout entirely. I mean, skipping a workout is not going to set your progress back in the greater scheme of things. I mean, a missed workout here and there, yeah, it, it doesn't feel good and it kind of ruins some of that momentum and motivation that you probably had built up. But in the greater scheme of things, it's not going to set you back. But if you push through and you train and end up, you know, pulling or tearing or hurting something, getting injured because you push through the pain, that's definitely going to set you back. So injury prevention is, is the number one thing that you need to focus on if you want to progress. And this becomes more apparent the older you get. So again, I just want to kind of share that with you. And hopefully, if, if that can impact just one person listening to this, if this can help prevent one injury, then it's time well spent. All right, let's move on now and answer some questions that are coming through. We got a lot of people tuned in joining us. A lot of questions coming through, which is always nice. All right, let's see. We have uh, Ann Kit joining us. Jesse's joining us. Bobby is joining us. All right. Uh, but, uh, Wayward is joining us. Carter. All right. Widulos is asking, how is it going with collagen supplements? Have you tried taking bone broth or gelatin as well? Okay, last video chat, I mentioned supplementing with collagen. Uh, this is, it's still in this, I guess, early phase where I really haven't noticed anything major yet in terms of, of any noticeable changes or physical sensations of, of something different. And I think with, with supplements such as collagen, it's it's kind of like, taking vitamins or even taking, um, you know, a protein powder or something like that, where it, you're not going to get an immediate noticeable effect from it. It's not like a stimulant, such as, say, like taking caffeine or something like that, where you get that instant noticeable effect from it. It's one of those things that kind of has to build up in your system. So I, I haven't really noticed anything different. But one thing that I, I will say is, is my joints tend to feel better, like, you know, aches and pains in terms of like knees and elbows and ankles and things like that. I find that that's knock on wood. I haven't had any uh, major aches or pains, which is good. And one thing that I mentioned before is I find that it's, it's helpful for controlling the appetite. I find that collagen is, is quite filling and satisfying when I have it either like uh, mix it in with a bowl of porridge, mix it in with a blender smoothie or something like that, or even just mix it in with a protein shake. 
I find that it helps to get, just give me some more substance in my stomach. It helps to fill me up and curb my appetite because it is a slower digesting protein, kind of similar to casein protein in that way. So it's a great way to uh, give you more uh, hunger uh, and uh, appetite suppression for longer, which can be advantageous for people who are trying to keep their caloric intake uh, under control, such as myself. Like I'm not trying to, I'm not really in a, a serious fat loss cutting phase or anything like that, but I'm in this more or less weight maintenance phase where I'm trying to control my appetite to the point where I uh, just keep my body fat in check. And I find that foods like the, the collagen supplement has definitely been helping me with that. All right, we have uh, Jesse's joining us. He says, I've been wanting to experiment with nicotine gum during my workouts. Would you recommend starting with a very low dosage? I've got a video about my experience with this. Uh, I've actually been using nicotine gum on and off for over a year now. I mean, I, I can't remember the exact time when I posted that video that I made about it. If you just do a search for Lee Hayward nicotine gum, you should find that video. But I, I was experimenting with it before I made that video because obviously I wanted to have some real world feedback in order to report to, to make that video. But I've been using it on and off since then. And some things that I found is it's very similar. In, in in terms of a mild stimulant effect, kind of like caffeine. Like if, if you're a coffee drinker, uh, you can kind of relate. It's, it's similar but different in terms of the stimulant type of effect you're gonna get. Uh, the thing that I like about uh, the nicotine gum is that it helps to curb your appetite, which is a good one. So for those of you who are trying to control your, your appetite and control your food intake or, or follow a fat loss cutting program, it's helpful there. It does give you a bit of an energy boost, like mental as well as physical. I find I feel more alert, more sharp. Uh, anytime that I want to do something that requires mental sharpness or mental focus, I, I usually use uh, the nicotine gum. For example, like when I'm racing, uh, you know, if I'm doing autocross racing or rally racing and I want to be sharp and focused, I'll, I'll usually chew a piece of beforehand because I find that just gives me a little bit of extra focus and uh, kind of like that. It's it's has like a mild pre workout type of, of effect to it, but it doesn't cause jitters or anything like that. And I find that the it doesn't disrupt my sleep cycle. So if if I need something later in the day, I find that the, the nicotine gum is great for later in the day and won't disrupt my sleep patterns later that night. Now I know some people are probably thinking, well, aren't you going to get addicted to it or whatever? Hey, I've I've used it on and off. I've went for like a week or more without it, and honestly, I, I don't I don't even think I'm as addicted to that as I am a regular cup of coffee. I mean, it's it's not addictive in and of itself if you use it in low dose, and I use it in very low dose. I think the smallest you can get is two milligrams, and that's what I use. So at the most, I use is two milligrams a day, right? I'll have a piece of gum per day, and I haven't had any negative issues with it so far. So it's, it's, there's a lot of research about this. I mean, if you just go search for it and do your own, you know, Google search on it, you can get oodles of studies on it. And uh, my experience with using it on and off for about the past year is I think it's definitely a nice tool to have in your toolbox of supplements, if you will. And it's, it's one of those things that it does have some benefits that you're not going to get through regular caffeine or pre-workout type supplements. All right, let's see what else we've got. Um, where else? Uh, Finn is joining us. He says, have a question about a rotator cuff injury. Well, you can certainly go ahead and post whatever your question is about rotator cuff injuries. I've had my share. Uh, I've got several videos about rotator cuff injuries as well. So if you want, like, just go on YouTube, search for Lee Hayward rotator cuff, and you'll see some different videos that I've posted there uh, about dealing with rotator cuff injuries. Um, so I'm just going to move on because he did, didn't actually specify what the question was. <laughs> uh, Sean is joining us. He's saying, does lifting weights help keep you young? I think it certainly does. I think exercise in general can help keep you young. It definitely helps to keep you mobile and active and helps keep you lean. Uh, I mean, there's, there's so many benefits to exercise in general, not just lifting weights, but I think lifting weights is definitely a part of a good overall exercise program because that strength training component, you're not going to get that through other forms of exercise. Like back in the day, for example, all the 
the medical professionals were really uh, advocates of cardiovascular exercise, walking and jogging and cycling and anything to do with cardio was good. And they kind of shunned strength training. This was back in the day, like I'm talking about decades ago. But now, you know, the more and more people have gotten involved with weight training. We see the benefits of it. I mean, it, it's, it is the closest thing we have to the fountain of youth. You see people now working out in their 60s, 70s, 80s and beyond. And, and still maintaining good health and mobility, all due to keeping active with weight training. All right, let's see what else we got. Joe is joining us. Tom is joining us. He says, uh, Tom is saying, this is my first time seeing your live stream. You, see very, you seem very knowledgeable and passionate about giving advice on the body and weightlifting. Great job. Well, thank you, Tom, for tuning in. I do appreciate your comment and support. Hopefully this is uh, not the last time you tune into a live video chat. All right, another question coming through here. What would you recommend when running, walking, jogging, seeing how far you can go or just go by a set time stopwatch timer? That really depends on what it is that you're, you're training for. What are you going for? Like, for example, with running, if, if you are a competitive runner and you're, you're getting ready for a race, maybe it's a 5K race, maybe it's a half marathon, full marathon, whatever it is, then you want to adjust your training according to whatever it is that you're training for. If you're simply doing it for exercise benefits, you know, to, to burn fat, to improve your cardiovascular health and feel better, it really doesn't matter. The most important thing is that you do it. That's the, that's the most important thing that I would recommend. Um, so, I mean, you can, if you want to add some variety and some structure to it, you can go and like, research different running websites and things like that and see like different types of running schedules because sometimes like guys will do like a long slow run one day maybe do some high intensity intervals another day do a moderate run the following day or, or whatever i mean there's different ways to structure a, a running program if you want to have a, a, a progressive and, and balanced program in place but for a lot of people who are using cardio as a supplement to their weight training you know for example like bodybuilders uh, the most important thing is that you just do it consistently and more often than not they will do it for time That's usually the way I do it. I'll usually just go for time So for example, I'll say well, like I got a half an hour. I'm going to do a half an hour of cardio and Usually as far as the intensity is concerned. I will allow my I will allow some flexibility there Like if I'm feeling energetic, I might do a higher intensity cardio session if I'm feeling a bit beat down and tired I might do a lower intensity session, but I try and do it consistently uh, on a regular basis and I, I more often than not if I'm going to monitor my cardio it's usually by time not so much by distance or speed or, or things like that but again I'm not saying that that's the, the right way or wrong way to do it it really depends on, on how you want to structure your workouts and what it is that you're training for uh, Finn is saying how long should one refrain from exercise if you have a rotator cuff injury from tennis uh, I, I can't tell if it's an impingement, but when I put my elbows at 90 degree angle and adduct arm to stomach, uh, using a band, it hurts. Abduction, abduction doesn't hurt at this point with the band. Just wanted to get your thoughts. All right, how long should you refrain from exercise? You you probably don't necessarily have to refrain from exercise but what type of exercise you're doing is going to be very important mobility movements is what i would recommend even if you're just doing you know mobility exercises with your arm like a rotator cuff rotation you know uh, external rotation just movements alone like that um, would be helpful because you want to get movement without causing strain or or aggravating the injury so even though you've probably pulled or strained or, or, or whatever you've done in there Movement is going to help to rehab it getting that blood flow that circulation and the movement is also going to help to prevent scar tissue from building up You know if you have torn something in there, so you definitely want to keep it active, but work within your pain threshold This is important because if, if whatever you're doing if it causes further pain and discomfort Then it's probably causing further damage, but if you can move the area and not experience pain in doing so then that's that's good that's active recovery and there's different things that you can do. I mean, some of those things, like I mentioned, like arm circles or different rotator cuff rotations, that's some stuff you can do at home. Uh, if you're at the gym, even just doing 
weight training exercises with the machines with very, very light weight. Like I'll give you an example, like um, the gym that I used to train, it had a full line of hammer strength equipment, you know, the plate loaded hammer strength machines. And I would use the hammer strength machines without any weight. I would just use the, the weight of the machine handles themselves and go through the motions. So high repetition bench presses, high repetition shoulder presses, high repetition pull downs and, and, and different exercises like that, just using the weight of the machine handles, which, you know, maybe like 10, 10 pounds or something like that, whatever it was, but just that light resistance going through the range of motion, getting the blood flow and the circulation and physically moving the muscles, you know, allowing it to go through a full range of motion to get that activity there to break up the scar tissue and to just aid with the recovery. And then as that felt good, as I like maybe week one, I would go through the motions with the machines with no weight at all. Week two, I probably put like a two and a half pound plate on, on each side of the hammer strength machine and do the same thing. Go through the motions with, with a little tiny bit more weight. And then the next week, you know, I add another couple pounds and add another couple pounds. And week by week by doing this, you'll build yourself up to the point where you can then go back to your regular routine or whatever it is. Uh, one thing I would be cautious about going back to sports like tennis swinging a tennis racket and serving and all that that is very explosive so you want to be fully 100 percent recovered before you go back to some high intensity explosive activity like that so as far as like your rehab workouts in the gym you should be able to go through your your weight training exercises and your mobility exercises without any pain whatsoever and then as you're getting yourself back into tennis like just Go through the motions with very slow movements, you know, and just make sure that you can actually go through the motions of swinging and all that without causing any pain and then eventually build yourself up slowly and slowly. It's it's like inch by inch you have to progress with this. And it, it can be a slow, tedious process. I mean, there's no magic formula or something that can give you to just like, boom, you're going to instantly recover. It's slow, continuous, active recovery over time building yourself back up to where you once were. And again, going back to what I mentioned at the beginning of the chat, this is why it's so important to warm up before you work out or before you do any strenuous exercise like this, because injury prevention is number one. You know, if, if you can prevent an injury, that is huge. Because once you get injured, that's going to set you back, right? It's going to set you back in your sport. It's going to set you back in your workouts, whatever it is. So you, you really have to be careful with this. So, uh, if, if you haven't already done so, it would be worthwhile to go see a physiotherapist, um, especially one who's used to working with athletes. Um, you know, and I know some people have mixed reviews of physiotherapists, and, and, and I agree, some of them are better than others for sure, but ask around your local area, get some recommendations, and go see someone who's used to working with athletes, and someone who can assess your body in person, assess your mobility, your range of motion, and, and what it is that you've actually got done to yourself, and then they can give you some specific exercises to help you with your rehab process. I mean, it might only take a few sessions, but I'm telling you, it will be well worth it. And every time I've had some serious injuries in the past, you know, I've went and, and seen physiotherapists and I, I'm glad I did, right? Because if they have helped point me in the right direction or, or enlightened me to things that I wasn't aware of prior. So it's definitely worthwhile to, to do that, to help speed up your injury or sorry, speed up the recovery from your injury. All right, let's move on. We have Manuel joining us. He says, Lee, if I'm using BCAs and essential amino acids, EAAs, can I use them together or do they have to be used separately? How many grams is safe, uh, et cetera? All right. You, if, if you have both, you've got a branch chain amino acid supplement and an essential amino acid supplement, you can take them together if you want. I mean, the essential amino acids also contains the branch chain amino acids, right? There's there's three branch chain amino acids. There's like nine essential amino acids. So I mean, yeah, no, you can, right? You can take them both, or you can take them separate. It really depends on how you want to do it. As far as an effective dose, uh, I usually recommend taking them prior to your workouts. You can either take them before, or even before and during, depending on how you're you're using them. I mean, if it's uh, if it's a capsule form, like you probably want to take it before the workout. If it's a drink mix, then you can drink it like before and during your workout. But uh, if, I mean, you could no problem at all mixing a serving of branch chain amino acids and a serving of essential amino acids. Have that mixed together in your water bottle and sip on that through your throat your workout. 
like you're not going to overdose on them. I mean, they're, they're essential amino acids. They're they're what your body requires anyway. It's it's the building blocks for all the muscle tissue and and you know everything in your body is made up of amino acids. So it's not like you know you're you're going to take too much or overdose on them or, or have any negative side effects because you took too many amino acids, right? I mean, you can mix up a serving of both. Um, to kind of give you a, a rough idea. Most guys would probably have about 10 grams of amino acids over the course of their workout to help aid with recovery. All right, Sean is joining us. He says, what is the science behind muscle memory? I'm in the military, and when we do combat training for weeks in the field, we come back small and drained, but the gains come back after starting again. All right, what is the science behind muscle memory? Well, Basically, what it means is it's easier to regain lost muscle than it is to gain it in the first place. So, if, for example, if, if at one point in time you built yourself up to a certain level of development, a certain level of strength, and then for whatever reason you've, in your case, okay, you went away and did some military training and, and you were away from your regular gym routine and your regular diet and all that, and you lost some size and strength. Once you get back to your regular routine, you're going to gain it back faster the second time around. Uh, this this has been, I mean, if, if you want to go do some searches on it, I mean, you can go to PubMed or any of the, you know, the, the study websites and research on it. But this is, is well known, the whole idea of muscle memory, meaning that it's easier to regain lost muscle than it is to gain it in the first place. So uh, I've experienced this myself. Like if, if I've been working out and, you know, took a layoff and then came back to the gym, I'll get back in shape a lot quicker the second time around. All right, Steve is joining us. He's saying, oh, second, now I just lost my spot here. All right, Steve saying, uh, Lee, how much time should be left between training individual body parts? For example, if you're training chest, shoulders on Wednesday, is it too soon to do the same split on Friday? It, there's a lot of variables involved with this. Uh, the old school recommendation is it takes 72 hours for a muscle group to recover. But even that is very generalized because how long a muscle group takes to recover depends on first how hard you trained it when you did train it, how many exercises, how many sets, how many reps, how much intensity did you place on that muscle. And it also is going to depend on your individual fitness level. I mean, someone who's brand new to working out is not going to have the same recovery and the same uh, work capacity to be able to handle high-frequency training sessions. So, uh, I mean, it, it really depends. I, I wish I could give you a, you know, a yes and no answer or, or something more specific, but it, it really depends. It's not a, a cut-and-dried, one-size-fits-all answer because it's a very individual thing. One thing that I will recommend is go by how you feel. If, for example, if you trained uh, your, your chest and shoulders on Wednesday and, okay, you're thinking doing the same thing again on Friday, that, that is pushing it a bit soon, unless, of course, you're, you did a very uh, short chest and shoulder workout on, on Wednesday. But uh, go by how you feel. I mean, if, if you feel recovered, there's no soreness, you feel strong and energetic and you can train again, then, then do it. And, and even... If you want to, just go through the process, do this a few weeks, and see how your body responds. I mean, if you find that you are making the progress, you can train, and, and you're seeing results, then keep doing it. But if you find that you, by the time you do that second workout each week, that you don't feel as recovered, your muscles are probably still a bit sore from the previous workout, you're not able to push the same weights, then that's a sign that you need more recovery time between training sessions. So again, it is an individual thing. It's something you're going to have to figure out for yourself with a bit of trial and error. All right, Lee, do you have any idea why my legs are strong but lift less when squatting? I'm 35 years old and only one year in the gym. All right, my legs are strong, but I lift less when squatting. All right, well, what, what do you mean by your legs are strong? I guess you're strong in other exercises. Um, to kind of give you an example, like, the weight you can lift in a leg press has no real correlation to the weight you can lift in a squat. Like the leg press is a lot easier than a squat. You know what I mean? You, you'll see guys maybe load up 500 plus pounds on the leg press machine and rep it out and not be able to do full squats with 100 pounds, right? So, I mean, a full squat is, is a very demanding exercise. And there's a lot more to it than just 
pure strength. There, there's technique, there's mobility, and, and all that comes into play as well. Whereas some other exercises, such as leg presses or, or leg extensions and leg curls, there, there's less technique involved because it's machine exercise. And sometimes you just due to leverage or whatever, you might be feeling stronger with that than you would say like with a full squat or a front squat or, or something along those lines. But bottom line, just focus on getting stronger in all exercises. And when it comes to the squat, focus on the technique first. Because again, it is a very technical exercise. So lighten up the weight. Even if you have to go through just using your body weight or using the empty barbell, just to master the technique first and then worry about progressive overload from there. But get the technique form down pat, and that will certainly help you in your quest for getting stronger, as well as building more muscle. All right, let's see what else we've got. Um, Jesse is joining us. What is your opinion on zero-calorie energy drinks? Are they the same as diet soda? There's a lot of similarities between a, a diet soda and a, a zero calorie energy drink, with the exception that the energy drink usually has a lot more caffeine and probably some other amino acids or, or stimulants added in there as well. But yeah, I mean, it's it's a very similar type of drink in terms of, you know, especially if you've got like a carbonated diet soda and you have a carbonated energy drink, you know, there, there's going to be a lot of similarities, but of course there's a lot more in the energy drink. Moderation is the key when it comes to that stuff. All right, Eric's joining us. He says, Lee, after the last few times I've been doing heavy deadlift sessions, I've noticed some rashes around my eyes. I assume it's from broken blood vessels, but wondering if this is a concern. If, oh, interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, you can definitely strain yourself when doing heavy lifts and, you know, break blood vessels. I mean, it's one, one that's common you see in a lot of... Uh, uh, power lifters and strongman uh, is nosebleeds, you know, because they strain so hard on their weight, you know, they get a nosebleed. And, and one thing that you will find is once you start getting some of these uh, blood vessels break, then they're more likely to break again unless you give it a lot of time to recover fully. So, for example, with your eyes, I mean, you're getting rashes around your eyes, and maybe it is broken blood vessels, I don't know. But yeah, what could be happening is is you could have broken a couple of blood vessels there, getting a bit of you know the, the redness and stuff, and then it's not fully recovering by the time you do your next training session. So then it could be easily breaking again. You know that's one of the things with with the nosebleeds, and I, I've experienced this myself back in the day. I used to uh, have a lot of issues with nosebleeds, and I something that I have to be careful of now. I mean because I even have both my nostrils cauterized and that, but. If I get into a, a, a phase of, of having a nosebleed, I have to be very careful with the recovery process because sometimes it doesn't fully heal and you're breaking it open again. So the same thing could apply with other types of uh, blood vessels as well. What I would recommend, uh, I, I get it checked out by your doctor because, I mean, this is something that's, you know, it, it's not normal, right? I mean, it's 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 kind of outside the box. And, and who knows? It might be just a correlation that you're experiencing this after a deadlift workout, but I mean, it might be a sign of, of another underlining health issue that you need to get checked out. Uh, personally, if I were in your situation, I'd get it checked out by my doctor just to be safe because it's, it does seem like a bit of a, a weird situation to be having a, you know, rashes around your eyes after deadlifting. All right, let's move on. We've got... Uh, Hi to Torah saying, finally, after all the past live streams, I missed. Thank you, coffee, for no sleep. Okay, he's joining us for a live stream, staying awake, keeping the coffee going. And with that, I'm going to have a sip of coffee myself. All right. Okay, with the Super Bowl Sunday coming up, what advice do you have for us? Because you know we're going to be eating junk. All right. If you are going to be pigging out for Super Bowl Sunday, what I would recommend over the next couple days, well, you really don't have much of a couple days. You only got one more day. Go easy on the food Saturday and, of course, all day Sunday leading up to the Super Bowl. And I would also get in some good quality workouts, get, like do some good uh, high-intensity weight training, some conditioning workouts, some cardio, whatever. But burn some good calories in advance. And this is going to help to prime your body so that when you do have your, your junk food, it's 
going to be more likely that some of that food is going to be used for recovery and growth rather than all getting stored as body fat. So you can have the mentality of you're going to burn it off in advance. All right. This is something you can do. And of course, after the Super Bowl and, you know, for the following week, you can still keep the weight training and the cardio going as well to help undo some of the damage done. But that's a strategy you can use anytime, you know, you're going to have a pre-planned cheat meal. Right. If you know you're going to go out to a restaurant for an all-you-can-eat buffet, or you know you're going to have Christmas dinner, or again Super Bowl snacks, right? Plan for it in advance. Right. Do some exercise in advance to kind of prime your body so that it's not going to all go to getting stored as excess body fat. Uh, prime example: last weekend we went out for a, a Sunday brunch, and of course it was a an all-you-can-eat buffet style Sunday brunch. And I mean, I enjoyed myself and it had several plates of, of food. But what I did before then is I went out for a cardio session beforehand. So I did an hour long of cardio before I went for brunch and kind of, again, using that mentality of I'm going to burn it off in advance and help to prime the body so that food that I'm eating uh, gets used somewhat for recovery and growth and not all just stored as excess body fat. And th that's something you can use Anytime. I mean, when you exercise before eating, it does help to increase your me metabolic rate. It does help to uh, encourage that food being stored as muscle glycogen rather than just body fat. All right. Jam is joining us. And he says, Lee, I've reached a 405 squat, 565 trap bar deadlift. My question is, can I officially retire from leg day? And leg training, if my legs are already too big, can I stick with push and pull? All right. Well, first off, I mean, that's a very respectable lifts. You know, 405 squat, 565 deadlifts. I mean, that's respectable for sure. Uh, can you stop leg training? Well, that's really a personal preference. I would not recommend stopping leg training entirely because you can very easily lose that strength and lose the size and make it harder to you know, it's, if you want, you can scale it back. That's what I'd recommend. I mean, if, if you want to kind of balance it out, like for example, if the legs are a strong area for you and your upper body is weaker, then do two upper body workouts for every leg workout or even three upper body workouts for every leg workout. But I wouldn't skip the leg workouts entirely. I'd still put them in there. I mean, there's, there's different ways to going about it. I mean, maybe you could just throw in a few exercises throughout the week, right? To kind of keep your legs up to par. Or maybe like every couple of weeks you do a full proper leg workout, but I wouldn't recommend skipping it entirely because you know it, it. The legs are important. Not only are they going to help to lay the foundation for you know the the leg muscles themselves, but it's going to help with all your body parts. I mean, the stronger you are with squats and deadlifts, I mean that's going to carry over into making your back stronger, making your your upper body stronger as well. I mean it's it's it has a progressional effect. So. I personally would not stop leg training, even if you have good legs. I mean, prime example, look at Tom Platts. I mean, the man had arguably the, the best legs in bodybuilding. Well, at least at his era in time, he had the best legs in bodybuilding. And he still trained legs, right? He didn't say, well, my legs are good enough. Let's stop. He still trained them. And, uh, I mean, that was part of what made him who he was, right? You know, that's what really set him apart, is having that strong body part. So if you have a strong body part, you know, don't, don't be afraid of it. You know, don't, don't shy away from it. Maximize it. All right, moving on. We have uh, Naheem is joining us. What are the most effective exercises using the BOSU, the BOSU ball? You know what? I don't use the BOSU ball for much. So, uh, I mean, there's different stability exercises you can do with it. Like you can do some explosive push-up exercises using the BOSU ball. Like if you turn it over, um, there's certain like squat balance mobility exercises. You can do some core work with it. But uh, honestly, I, I don't even have a BOSU ball for my home gym and I don't use it very much at the gym. So, but with that being said, I'm sure you can go on YouTube and do a bunch of, do just a search for BOSU ball exercises and you can get a lot of them. But uh, I mean, I like to do exercises where my feet are planted firmly on the ground most of the time. I find that if you're doing some of these weird stability exercises, I mean, yeah, they can be beneficial, but you want to be careful with it because it's easy to to really, you know, twist something up. I mean, for example, like if you're doing squats on a BOSU ball, 
I mean, okay, if you're doing body weight squats, it's not such a big deal. But you see some people like literally try and load up a barbell and do squats on a stability ball with a loaded barbell on their back. Or, I mean, the risk of injury, like, you know, look at the, the risk to reward ratio here. And, and a lot of times it's, it's not in your favor, right? You know, like I was mentioning earlier about the whole thing about injury prevention, that, that applies to the exercises you do as well. So that's why I'm not a big fan of, of weird exercises like that. Uh, Oysen's joining us and he's saying, is it bad to do chest flies twice a week on a push-pull workout? I mean, if, if you can recover from it, then no. I mean, I, I've I've done fly exercises twice a week or more. I mean, like, for example, if, um, if I'm doing like a total body workout, sometimes I'll do flies, say, three times a week. It really depends on your recovery ability and, and everything else. So, I mean, it's not necessarily good or bad. It, it's what you can make work into your schedule and what you can recover from. Okay, moving on. Uh, Finn is saying many thanks. Uh, you're so right. One day without a proper warm-up is when this happened. Warm-up cannot be overstated. Okay, he's referring back to his question about the rotator cuff. He, he didn't warm up properly, and he ended up injuring a rotator cuff, right? I mean... Uh, it, it's good that you're aware of that now, but it sucks that it happened. And sometimes we have to learn these lessons the hard way. And, and I'm speaking from experience, like all the stuff that I'm talking about, the, the warm ups and things like that. That's because I've, I've been in these situations where I didn't warm up properly and it ended up, you know, injuring and snapping something up in the process. So it's unfortunate that you have to learn the lesson the hard way, but hopefully now that you've learned it, you'll pay more attention to your warm ups in the future. All right, let's see what else we've got. Um, Azim is saying, Lee, please make a detailed video about your recent big achievement. What's my big recent achievement? <laughs> uh, I, 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 I'm not being sarcastic or nothing. Like, yeah, you got me, you got me stumped here. I don't, I don't know what it is that you're referring to. If you want to send me a private message about what that video is, uh, please let me know. Uh, Steve is joining us saying, uh, appreciate you answering my question. Really appreciate the helpful advice. Now you're welcome, Steve. Uh, all right. Uh, hi, Tora saying, Lee, I have a problem with losing fat. I used to go to the gym. I tried dieting and eating clean. The best I can lose is five kilograms at most, and I'm 130 kilograms, uh, 100, or 1.8 meters tall. Any advice? Uh, would have a positive impact. All right. If, if you can lose five kilograms, guess what? You can lose more. The key to dieting it is not dieting harder. It's dieting longer. That's the key. So you've tried dieting, you've tried exercise, and you've lost five kilograms. Well, guess what? You diet longer, you exercise longer, and you, you just keep the, with the process, and you will lose more. Now, the initial weight loss is going to come quicker because in that initial weight loss, you're not just losing pure body fat. You're losing water. You're losing intestinal bloat and all that. But the key is is to diet longer. And I'll give you a prime example. Even at my level, when I was competing in bodybuilding on a regular basis, it still took me six months to go from off-season to pre-contest shredded. It would take me six months. Now, I know some people probably get away with, you know, three months or, or, or less, but I found for, for my body type, for my metabolism and everything else, I'm, I'm not a naturally lean guy. It would take me six months of dieting to go from off-season smooth to contest shredded. That's what it took. So I want to ask you, have you stuck to your diet for six months straight? And I don't mean like six months of on and off. I mean six months of consistent, like six months of exercise every single day, six months of following your diet every single day, six months of consistency every single day. If you haven't, then that's the reason why you're not losing weight. It's just because you're not consistent. You're not doing it long enough, right? Most people who are struggling and saying, well, I, I've tried this, I've tried that, and it doesn't work. It's because they haven't tried it long enough or they haven't tried it consistently enough. That's, that's usually the, the problem right there. All right, Anthony is joining us. Uh, how about a 50-year-old full body workout like Steve Reeves? Okay, it's a suggestion for a future video. I could certainly look into that. Um, 
All right, Vincent is saying, Lee, I'm going to be 65 this year and can still do 225 for three reps. Uh, you can probably hear my son out there in the hallway. Whoa, he's excited. All right, we'll leave it at that. Anyway, Vince is saying he can. he's 65 this year. He can rep 225 for three reps. Do you recommend a push-pull routine or a full-body workout for me three days a week? Um, I, I change it up, honestly. I mean, like if people say, well, what's the best workout? What's the best split? Change it up. Uh, for, for the past several months, I've been doing a, a full-body workout, and it's been working great for me, but I was kind of getting bored with that. So now I've changed it up, and I'm doing – uh, basically, I've actually switched up to more of a powerlifting style workout where I'm doing uh, two bench press days a week and two squat deadlift days a week. That's the way I'm training right now. And I'll, I'll follow that probably for, you know, a couple months and then I'll probably switch it up and do something totally different. So, I mean, when it comes to your workout programs, the best program is the one you're not doing. So, whatever it is that you've been doing up until now, like let's say you've been doing a push pull legs. I mean, if, if, if you're getting bored with that, hey, try a full body workout. If you've been following a full body workout and you're getting bored with that, then try push pull legs. If, 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 you're, if you want, try a, a bodybuilding split or maybe some, uh, you know, conditioning or strength training program. You have, you have all these different programs available, and it's not that one is necessarily better than the other. It's you have available all these different training modalities that you can incorporate. And that's why with the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Inner Circle member site, I offer a workout of the month program because it just provides that ongoing training variety and stimulation to keep your workouts fun and, and interesting and also keep you progressing. So, I mean, I like to do it in a complementary fashion. So, I mean, one month it might be a bodybuilding style training program. The next month it might be a power style training. The next month it might be a metabolic and conditioning program. And then we can go through the whole type of rotation again with different workout programs. I mean, there's, you don't have to get stuck in, Oh, I'm, I'm a total body workout guy, or I'm a push pull legs guy, or I'm only this guy. You can you can incorporate all these different workout programs into your routine and then cycle through them. All right, let's see what else we've got. Um, let's see. All right, Azim is asking. He says, my question is regarding full body alternate day routine. If I go to the gym one day and do cardio the next, don't you think that my muscles will be overdone, specifically legs, since we need 48 hours of recovery on our muscles? If we do full body and cardio, there's no time to recover. But you promote this routine quite often. Don't you think it's overload? Not necessarily, because if you're doing low intensity cardio, like I usually recommend, it's yes, it's physical exercise, but it's not demanding exercise. Like for example, if if I in my own case, yesterday I went to the gym and I did squats. Today I did cardio. I went for a walk. That walk was not demanding enough or draining enough on my legs that it hindered my recovery from the squats. So um, it's totally fine to to do cardio alternated with weight training. I mean it's. <sighs> I mean, for someone who's who's totally new to working out and their work capacity is so low and their recovery is so low that doing cardiovascular exercise, like going for a walk or something like that, if, if that is breaking down your muscles and causing you to get sore, then okay, yeah, maybe you'll need to to break it up and, and allow more recovery time or something like that. But if, if you're in decent shape to begin with, uh, there's no harm in doing a weight training workout one day and cardio the next. You know, you, you should be able to recover from that. And if you can't now, then with consistency over time, you will build up your work capacity to the point where you can recover from that. But again, it, it, all this stuff is is really individual, right? I mean, you have to listen to your own body. If, if you try weight training one day and then doing cardio the next, and you find that it's just too much for you, you feel beat up, you're tired, you're sore, you're exhausted, then obviously you're either going to have to scale back the intensity of those workouts or allow more recovery time between the workouts. Probably I would start with scaling back the intensity if you're feeling that beat up after a workout program. But again, it's 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 really an individual thing. But the good news is the more consistent you are, the more often you do it, 
the more your body's going to be able to adapt to it and you build up your work capacity so that you can train and do physical exercise on a daily basis and still recover from it. All right, let's see what else we've got here. Uh, Anthony is joining us. He says, is stretching more for your joints or for your muscles? Uh, it's both. Uh, when you stretch, you are going to stretch the muscles. You're also going to stretch the, the, the joints and the connective tissue and the tendons and ligaments. So you, you are going to stretch it all, but um, mostly it is going to be for the, the muscles themselves, right? That's what's going to be have the biggest uh, impact. But you are going to also notice it helps with your joints and connective tissue as well. All right. Uh, Lee, have you ever thought about starting a martial arts channel as well? I remember correctly you did martial arts. Uh, yes, I did, but that was years ago. And, and quite honestly, I don't feel qualified enough to start a martial arts channel. And I'm not practicing martial arts now, so it would be kind of... No, <laughs> I'm not going to start a martial arts channel. Uh, Arnold's joining us, and he says, I started off with a classic three-day full-body split routine. Should I lift on all all these three lift on all these three heavy, or should I lift on one day heavy, day two medium, and day three light? <sighs> okay, three-day full-body split. Um, you just started. I would not recommend going super heavy by at the start of any workout. Just ease your way into it. So, I mean, the, the first time you go through the workout, just take it easy. You know, stop your set short of failure. Go through the motions. Just get used to the new exercises. And then work on each week gradually building up the intensity, gradually adding weight to the barbells, you know, just building it up week by week. So, Always start off light. Always start off on the conservative side. And this gives you room to progress week by week. Now, as you get more advanced, you may want to change that up. For example, like you could do one workout which focuses more on heavy weights. Another workout may be focusing more on, you know, high repetitions. Another one may be like an active recovery type of workout. It really depends. But starting off, uh, always start off conservative and build yourself up week by week. Okay, uh, Nazim is saying, I'm having issues with power cleaning or snatching more than my body weight. What exercises would you recommend to get past this? My weight is 165 pounds. I'm not an Olympic lifter, and I've never been properly trained in the Olympic lifts, so I don't feel that this is something that I'm really qualified to uh, to talk about. I mean, I've, I've trained in powerlifting. I've trained in bodybuilding. That's what I focused on. I've never really focused on the Olympic lifts, so I, I'm going to pass on this one, and uh, hopefully we find someone who is more of a, an Olympic lifting coach who can help you with that one. Okay, when it comes to improving the squat technique, would you suggest a Smith machine changing from high bar back to front squats or anything else? Okay, improving squat technique. And... I, I would recommend sticking to whatever squat that it is that you're trying to focus on. So if, if it is the back squat that you're trying to focus on, stick with the high bar back squat with a barbell and focus on that. You know, use lighter weight, just really master the technique, multiple sets of low reps. And, and this is a strategy that a lot of powerlifters use, the whole multiple sets of low reps, because that gives you more first reps and more practice setting up under the barbell. Uh, one of the drawbacks to doing traditional high rep bodybuilding lifts, for example, like I, I'll give you an example. Like a, a powerlifting squat workout might be 10 sets of three reps. A bodybuilding squat workout is probably going to be three sets of 10 reps. The difference is if you do 10 sets of three reps, you set up under the barbell 10 times, you get uh, 10 first reps. And you get more technique practice. Whereas if you're only doing three sets of 10, you only set up three times. So if you want to focus on the technique, multiple sets, lower reps, 
And also, I would recommend using lighter weight and just focus on working on the technique. That's what you really want to focus on. Now, for a beginner or someone who's, who's never squatted before, yeah, you could probably, you know, do a, a Smith machine squat or something like that just to kind of get used to the movement. But if you're more advanced, then I would recommend a, a barbell squat and working on your technique. Multiple sets, low reps, and really focus on that technique. All right, Arnold is saying, my three-day split routine program includes three days of bench presses. Is that okay? If you are recovering from it and you're making gains with it, then by all means, that is okay. Again, it really depends on what else you're doing for your chest, your shoulders, and your triceps. I mean, if your only main exercise is the bench press and you do that three days a week, then you can probably recover from it. But if you're doing other exercises and you're placing a lot more strain on those muscle groups, then you, it probably would be too much. So, again, it really depends on the overall program. All right, deadlifts for lower back and upper back. Deadlifts for lower back and upper back stiffness form all the sitting and my ankles feel bad too. All right, I'm not sure. Deadlift for lower back and upper back stiffness form all the sitting and my ankles feel bad too. I'm not sure what you're asking. Are deadlifts, okay, I'll, I'll try and break it up the best I can. Are deadlifts for the lower back? Yeah, you'll certainly work your lower back using deadlifts. Uh, upper back stiffness from sitting, if you are getting upper back stiffness from sitting, it's probably because you're using poor posture. So sitting upright, and I'm probably even guilty of this now while I'm sitting down here doing this uh, video chat. But purposely doing some neck exercises, stretching your neck, uh, working your upper back. I mean, um, all this is important, if you, especially if you're having stiffness in the upper back. I actually made a, a video showing some good neck exercises that you can uh, incorporate and it, it, if you want to find the video, you'll have to search for something totally different. It's, it's Lee Hayward, Unexplained Finger Pain. And the reason why I got into making this video about neck exercises was because I was having unexplained finger pain, meaning that all of a sudden, one day, my index finger just started painting like crazy, and I didn't know what the hell I'd done. I thought, you know, maybe I did something with my hands, maybe carpal tunnel syndrome acting up. I don't know what, but my index finger was just causing me crazy pain. I didn't know what the hell was going on. So I went to my doctor, and lo and behold, after he did his, you know, diagnosis and everything else, it turned out I had an impinged nerve in my neck that was causing the pain to go down through the neck, down through the shoulders, all the way to the index finger. So he recommended some exercises for my neck and my upper back, which helped to cure my index finger pain. So these exercises that I mentioned for the neck, uh, you know, they, you can use it if you have stiff upper back and stiff neck, but they also can you know, indirectly, it may help with a lot of issues that you're probably not aware of because all the nerves through the body run through the neck, down through the spine to, you know, all your extremities, right? Your, your fingers, your toes, your legs, you know, everything runs down through the spine. So uh, if you are experiencing upper back stiffness, those neck exercises can probably help with that as well. So again, to, to see those exercises, do a search for Lee Hayward finger pain. It's a YouTube video. If you find that video, uh, watch it, and right in the middle of it, I cover a whole bunch of different really good neck and upper back exercises that you can do. All right, I'm going to get ready and clue it up sh shortly, but let's just see. We've got to take a couple more. Um, okay, I really have loud knee... Crepitis, I think it is. I'm not sure. Uh, especially when I do it squats and lunges, should I avoid these exercises? Uh, I guess you mean your knees are cracking. If, if, if I guess that's what you probably mean when you're doing squats and lunges, you get a cracking sensation in the knees. You know, the knees pop and crack. Uh, it really depends on how it feels. Because when I do squats or, or lunges or anything like that, for my first couple warm up sets, I'll get some cracking in the knee joint, right? You know, I, I, I got to go through those progressive sets first, and I'll find that my knees will crack initially. But once I get those cracks and kinks out of the joints, then I can go on with the rest of the workout without any joint cracks or at all. 
it's almost like cracking your knuckles. Like, you, you know, usually you can crack your knuckles once or twice, and then after that, they won't crack anymore because you've limbered up the, the joints. I find the same thing happens with my knees, elbows, shoulders, hips. Uh, I use That's why I have to go through several progressively heavier warm-up sets to get those kinks and cracks out first. Then I can go on with the rest of the workout. So as long as it doesn't cause you any pain or discomfort, it, it's not a bad thing. It's kind of, it's pretty normal, actually, for people to have to go through this. So... Uh, what I would recommend when you're doing those squats and lunges, start off with some body weight squats, body weight lunges first, go through full range of motion, high reps, just to get the joints warmed up. And if it feels good, then you can go on with progressively heavier warm up sets and, and you know, work your way up to your top weight working set. Uh, but if it causes any pain or discomfort, then I would recommend avoiding those exercises and either doing a different move entirely that doesn't cause pain or discomfort, or if, if it's something that's you know ongoing and really causing you a lot of uh, discomfort through multiple exercises, then you should get it checked out by a physiotherapist to see if there's an underlining uh, injury that you've got going on there. But again, ha having some cracks and, and kinks and stuff like that in the joints, it's it's pretty normal. It, it is. It's, it's more, more common than not for a lot of people, especially the more experience you get. Okay, let's move on. Azim is saying, I've made com a commitment that I'll gain 40 to 50 pounds of muscles in the next 10 years, but that begs the question, till what age should I be gaining muscle and when to stop gaining and start losing it? Okay, you made a commitment to gain 40 to 50 pounds of muscle in the next 10 years. And, and for most people, to put 50 pounds of muscle on your frame is pretty close to someone's like natural genetic limit. Now, I'm using that term loosely because everybody's limits and genetics are, are individual. Like some people have better genetics than others, some people have worse genetics. But for the most part, if, if you can put 50 pounds of muscle on your frame, that's probably gonna be like your genetic limit. And over the course of, of 10 years or so, you know, it's probably what it's gonna take. You know, it may take longer. I mean, as far as, what age should you continue to build and what age should you stop? That's, you're thinking too far in the future. And I mean, I don't have a crystal ball. I can't predict the future for you in terms of like how long you're going to be able to gain muscle and what, you know, age you're going to be when you have to start being more conservative or whatever. That's an individual thing, right? What I would focus on is, I mean, it's cool to have that long-term goal uh, of, of what you're going to do in 10 years time, but just focus on the short term and, and focus on doing the best you can right now over the next, you know, few weeks, few months. And I mean, work on gaining that first five pounds of muscle, like try, it, it's kind of pointless to plan, okay, your workouts that you're going to do in 10 years from now, because I mean, heaven forbid, we don't even know if you're going to be around 10 years from now. We don't know if we're all going to be around 10 years from now. We, we don't know. So, I mean, why even waste the mental bandwidth thinking about, you know, how you're going to work out in 10 years time, focus on what you're going to do now, right? Focus on your next, next few workouts. That's, that's what I would do. Uh, what do you think about intermittent fasting? I am a big fan of intermittent fasting and I think it can be a great strategy for controlling your, uh, overall caloric intake. And it's a great way to control body fat. But it's also good for your digestion. I find that the older I get, the, the uh, having that break of you know a, a fasting period each day gives my digestive system a break. And, and I was actually having a conversation with somebody today about this. And, and one thing that I've noticed a benefit since I've started incorporating intermittent fasting is I find that it it has helped take away some of the uh, the bloat that I experience in my midsection. I mean, because I found when I was eating multiple meals a day, you know, the, the typical six meal a day bodybuilding type of program, even if I was you know, trying to diet for fat loss, but eating frequent meals, I found I had like a distended belly from eating so much food or eating so frequently, I should say, because I wasn't giving my digestive system a break. So I always had a bit of a, a, a distended stomach. Even when I was quite lean, I still have a bloated belly. But I found that with intermittent fasting and giving myself, you know, maybe 12 to 16 hours or more per day, sometimes even longer, 
of no food in my system, it really helped to kind of like reset my uh, digestive system and that, and it also helped to uh, take away a lot of the bloat that I was experiencing in my midsection. So I, I, I feel better and I, I actually look better because of it. So from uh, a fat loss, weight maintenance point of view, I think it's great. From a gaining mass, bulking up point of view, I don't think it's that great <laughs> because it's it's a lot harder to consume a caloric surplus if you're eating uh, very few meals. But from someone who's not trying to bulk up anymore and you're just basically trying to either lose fat or maintain your weight, I think it's a great strategy. Okay. Uh, Beto is saying, thanks, Lee. Really love your content. Well, you're welcome. I'm glad you appreciate that. All right. All right, guys. I'm going to get ready and clue it up for today. I, again, thank you so much for tuning in. Thanks for all the questions and uh, support. I do appreciate it. Uh, just give you a heads up. Next week, I'm going to be traveling. I will not be uh, doing a live video chat next Friday. So for those of you who are regulars, give you that heads up now. I'm actually going to be traveling to Florida. I'm going to be down for a fitness mastermind event down in uh, Clearwater, Florida. And I'm going to be spending some time down there, uh, hopefully doing some networking and collaborations with some other uh, fitness YouTubers down there while I'm in Florida. So just want to give you a heads up. No video chat next week. Uh, I'll probably do one the following week thereafter. Um, but there won't be one next week. There. <laughs> So there we go, guys. Again, take care. Have yourself a great weekend, and I'll talk to you in a couple weeks' time. Over and out.